Well, good morning, IBC. I'm Craig, and it's really good to be with you this morning. Because you know, the last time I stood on this stage was January 5th of this year. It was the very first Sunday of the new year as we launched into this new decade. And there was just a sense of anticipation and excitement in the air as we thought about all that God might be doing in us and through us through this next year. And the lesson that I talked about was based on the Old Testament prophet Elisha. And the title of the lesson was called Good to Go. And one of the main things that we learn from his life is that it seems like the people that God uses the most in this world are those who are willing to hold on to the least. And I asked the question that day that if God showed up in this place and he asked, would we be willing, would I be willing to give up, to let go of whatever it was he was asking from me so that I could follow after him? And I so want my answer to be yes to that question because I want my life to align with the heroes of our faith, the people that I read about on the pages of scripture who lived a life of uh, passion and and meaning and intentionality. And so I left that Sunday uh, feeling kind of confident that I thought I was good to go. I thought I was ready. God, bring on 2020, I'm good to go. And 2020 began and it started off really good. February, our middle son got married and we all flew out to California, friends and family to celebrate that, one of the last big gatherings that we were a part of. And so that was fun. And then in March, spring break came and we had the opportunity to take our little family to a a little house we rented by the beach in Florida. Got to watch my granddaughter who just turned two last week play out in the sand and we were having so much fun that week and every once in a while I'd walk by the TV screen in the house and I'd see the little ticker go across that said something about this new coronavirus but it really didn't register with me. I didn't think much of it until Thursday when a friend of ours from here texted me and said, things have gone crazy here. And he sent me a picture of the local Tom Thumb and the aisles were packed with people and the shelves were empty. And we all looked at that picture and just thought, what is going on? Has, has the end of all time come? And we came back from that trip and spring break ended up being extended an extra week. And then eventually the whole school year was canceled and we're in the school business. Preschool is what we do. And so we weren't sure what this means. And toilet paper and hand sanitizer and Clorox wipes were on the you know, forefronts of everyone's mind. And then eventually Texas kind of shut down for several weeks and our school attendance dropped 90% because only essential workers were allowed to bring their children to school. And so I was asking God, God, I don't know what you're doing here, but I told you I'd be good to go. So it looks like here we go. And then summer came and things began to open back up. People started going back to work. We started our summer session at our school with about 80% attendance. We were so excited about that. It felt like we were back up on the upswing. And so our finances were improving and at least we had our health and We got to the end of June and uh, my wife, Kathy, on a Friday night got a headache that she just couldn't seem to shake. And so by Saturday morning, it had just gotten worse. And so uh, she said, I think maybe I need to be tested for COVID. And so we wanted to find a place that did rapid testing. They were kind of hard to find back in June. So we ended up on a Saturday morning having to drive to Tyler, Texas to get her tested. A two hour drive. She rode in the back seat. I rode in the front seat. We both had our masks on. Uh, We get there, pull into the parking lot. The doctor comes out, does the swab, and then leaves us sitting in the car for about an hour and a half. And we're kind of laughing, thinking this is probably silly that we even did this. You don't have COVID. And, uh, you know, but this will be a great story to tell one day. And the doctor came back out to the car and said, I'm sorry, but you've tested positive. And we were just stunned. I mean, what does this mean for Kathy and for her health? And how is this going to progress? And What does this mean for our business? We ended up having to close our school for an entire week. What does this mean for our family? We're now in two-week quarantine, all of us. And what does this mean for me? I'm still in the car with her, and we've got to drive back two hours uh, from Tyler back to Dallas. So I put her way back in the back with a mask, and I had my mask on hanging my head out the window like a dog going down the highway, hoping to not get it. But it just felt like we had plummeted back down into the valley that it was just this ups and downs. And and my attitude with God of I'm good to go was quickly devolving into just plain old I'm good. 
I'm good, God. I think, I think you've done enough now. You can stop now. Just leave me be now. Because, you know, this, this feels like a roller coaster. Okay, things are getting better. No, they're not getting better. I think we're almost done with this. No, we're not almost done with this. And I mean, here we are in September now. And who would guess that I'd be standing here talking to a camera with an empty auditorium behind me. I'm literally talking to a brick wall while you're at home in your PJs. The world is not as it should be. And we're all a little worn out on phrases like new normal and unprecedented and uncertain. Um, because see what I want, what I think a lot of us want is this you know, beautiful life of just this smooth upward line to our lives up and to the right. God, uh, just, I want it all planned out and, and I'll give you the plan. Here's the plan, God, that I'm gonna go to school and then I'm gonna meet my soulmate and we're gonna get married and we're gonna get this great job and live in this nice neighborhood and have perfect kids and everyone's gonna just get along and then those kids are gonna grow up and they're gonna get a job and they're gonna meet their soulmate and on and on. That's the way I want my life to go, at least I, th I thought. But it isn't the way life works, is it? Because we live in a broken world. We live in a world that's not a happily ever after kind of world. Because in this world, marriages fall apart. In this world, people lose their jobs. In this world, finances are unpredictable. In this world, health is fragile. In this world, kids can be a great joy, but they can also bring great heartache. And if you watch the news at all, you know that in this world, we don't all just get along. There's racial divides, political differences, uh, justice disparities. There's all these ups and downs, these uh, mountaintops and valleys, these uh, desperate nights, these peaks. These, it just seems to go up. It's like a graph on an EKG monitor in a hospital room. But you know what I've learned after 59 years of life? That that's okay. Because the, the, the straight line that I think I want, the flat line, at least in the medical community, means what? means death. It means there's nothing significant happening here. It is the ups and downs in life that actually mean that there's still life happening and that I get to be a part of it, that I'm a part of this life. And as imperfect as it may be, it is a gift from our God. And I know 2020 has been tumultuous for so many of us, but one day odds are that there will be a vaccine for COVID-19 and this election cycle is gonna come and go. And we all pray that these racial differences and, and justice disparities will be corrected and uh, will cease one day. But don't we all know that even if all of that happens, that uncertainty will still continue on. It'll just be around different topics and issues. It's the reality of us living in this broken world. And our default, I think, is to, to start questioning God. God, why? Why me? Why this? Why are you not stopping this? Um, but uncertain times, they're not anything new. If you look in this Bible, this book that we read, it's just full of stories that are taking place in the midst of enormous uncertainty. It's in the Bible that we find stories like young Joseph who's thrown into a pit by his brothers and he sits down there while he listens to them decide, are we gonna kill him or are we gonna sell him? It's in this book that we find stories of kings like King David, who was a man after God's own heart and his son grew up to rebel against him and try to overthrow his kingdom. It's in this book that we find stories of young moms who the young mom who had to wrap up her child, put him in a basket and send him down the Nile River. Story after story after story of people who go through chaotic, unprecedented times where it seemed like things had spun, spun out of control and God had gone AWOL and evil was winning. And then you discover over and over and over and over again that in the midst of those extraordinary moments of uncertainty that our God is still alive and he's well and nothing has changed and his purposes continue unthwarted. And things move forward just like he's planned, that God really is the only constant in this world of uncertainty. John Mark Comer is a pastor in Portland, and he uses the term holy uncertainty. I love that term, holy uncertainty, because it just recognizes the truth that God often uses the uncertain times like we find ourselves in today, these God-appointed, God-ordained times to form us and to transform us into a people who live and love and serve more and more like Jesus. Author Pete Scazzaro in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, uses a similar term. He uses the term confusing in between times. And he says these times always take longer than we expect and they're harder than we would want. But it's in the confusing in between times that God does some of his best work in us. So maybe 
There's a different question that we ought to be asking of God during these challenging days so that when we come out on the other side of this, whether that's weeks from now or months from now or next year, that we will come out more and more as people marked by faith and hope and love. What if instead of all the whys, we start asking God, what are you trying to teach me through this? What are you wanting to do in me through this time or through me? And so today, I want us to look at the story of the Exodus as the children of Israel escape out of Egypt and head out towards the promised land. At the time, they're thinking they were embarking on this routine, rather short, familiar trek. But in reality, it ends up being a 40-year journey through the wilderness of uncertainty and difficulty and challenges. And yet God uses that time to teach them some invaluable lessons that I think we would be wise to consider as we face our own uncertain times. If you have your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 13, beginning in verse 17. It says this, it says, when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in the roundabout way through the wilderness towards the Red Sea. And thus the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. And this allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. Now, what stands out right away about this story is that God's taking them on this unexpected journey on a path that they were not expecting to the promised land. And we're gonna get to that. But, but I think it's important that the writer here alerts us first to why God is doing what he's doing. Notice it says, God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt, back to slavery, back to bondage. God's fear is that his people will end up wanting to return to Egypt rather than move out into the unknown, even if the unknown is so much better. This land filled with milk and honey. And so I think the first lesson God's teaching us and them through this story is that if we really wanna live the life that God intends, We have to be willing to let go of the familiar because whether our current familiar is really good or honestly, even if it's not so good, we still all tend to want to cling to that which we're familiar with because it's more comfortable. There's something about us, I think, that feels like if we know it, then we can control it. And the bottom line is we all want to have some sense that we're in control, don't we? Because letting go is scary, But letting go is necessary if we're gonna live into the adventure that God wants for us. When our kids were younger, we used to take them every weekend, once a year on a weekend uh, family camp trip down to Pine Cove Camp. And invariably, one of the first things my boys wanted to do was take me up to the zip line. And I love that because I love just feeling like I'm, you know, gliding across the treetops, wind, there's nothing holding me back. And so we would do that every time we went. But I remember the first time we did it. We all climbed up that ladder to that high platform and we got up there and the counselor strapped us all in and said, just sit on the side of the platform. And when I count to three, just slide off and you'll go. And so we sit on the side of the platform and I made the mistake of looking down. And it looks a lot higher when you're up on the platform than it does when you're climbing up the ladder. And immediately my hands just clenched on to the wooden planks that were the platform. And she said, I'm gonna count and you can go. And she said, three, two, one. And all three of my boys went. And they looked like they were having the time of their lives. And I looked down and my knuckles were white. I think my fingers had fused into the wood itself. And the kind counselor just leaned forward and she said, sir, you're free to go now. And I said, I I know. I know in my head I'm free to go. I can't let go of this platform. But I can see how fun this is gonna be. And I really wanna do this. So I'm gonna have to ask you a favor. Would you just sneak up behind me? And would you push me off the platform when I'm least expecting it? Because if I'm expecting it, I'm gonna resist you. So I'm gonna just need you. And right about there, she pushed me off. And I went. And it was so much fun. See, God has this abundant, over-the-top kind of adventure planned for our lives. And yet so often, we're holding on to the platform. We're unwilling to let go. And sometimes I think God has to shake it up. He has to rock our boat. He has to introduce the unexpected in our lives to get us to loosen our grip, to let go, to give up our need to always be in control. Because here's the deal about control. We all think we want it. 
We'll do whatever it takes to try and get it. But I would argue that control is actually the issue underneath so many of the issues that block and hamper and derail our spiritual formation into becoming the kind of people who love like Jesus. And love, love is the hallmark of our faith. And yet controlling people are not very loving people, are they? Controlling people dominate and manipulate in order to get others to believe or behave in a certain way just so that they can feel okay. But love, love is about accepting and delighting in people just for who God made them to be. I think God wants to teach us in the confusing in-between times to let go, to let go of our need to control it or fix it or manipulate it or dominate over it. Because until we can let go, we'll forever be sitting on a platform of a mundane, mediocre, unremarkable life gripping the sides and missing out on all the adventure of what it feels like to soar into the extraordinary life that God wants for all of us. We have to learn to let go. But the second lesson I think we learn in this story is God is teaching them that even in the times of uncertainty, he is always with us. Notice the phrases here. God led them. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them. He did not remove the pillar from in front of his people. See, God didn't hand Moses a map and say, here, follow this and call me when you get there. He didn't drop a phone out of the sky with a GPS and say, open your Google Maps. I've already programmed in promised land and enjoy your journey. He went with them. He gave them his presence as a guide. And when I think about traveling in those times where I've had to use a map and a schedule and I've been the one in control versus the times where we've been able to use a guide, there's just a world of difference between those two experiences. Early on in our marriage, Kath and I went to Nashville on a vacation, and I've told y'all before that I'm a huge Amy Grant fan. Some would say I border on an obsession, and, and I get that. But we had gone to Nashville, and one morning, Kathy said, hey, I was just thinking, might be fun if we drove down to Franklin and tried to see if we could find Amy Grant's farm, just to see what it looks like. And I said, you had me at hay, and I was in the car mapping it out, and we had a paper map, not a Google or a phone at the time, and so I circled Franklin, we got in the car, said this will be easy route. We started heading north on Highway 65 out of Nashville and drove about 30 minutes. And Kathy said, hey, I thought Franklin was only about 20 minutes from where we were. And I said, mm, no, nope, I, th I think it's farther. I've mapped it out. Don't worry about it. We went a few miles further and she said, I haven't seen any signs that say Franklin. And I said, Kathy, I've got this. Promise me. It's, it's, I promise you it's circled right here. And here comes a highway sign. Let's just see what it says. And it said, thank you for visiting Tennessee. Welcome to Kentucky. And she looked over at me with that look. You know, you guys know the look. It's kind of a half, my dad would be so disappointed in you right now. And <laughs> half, you're a moron. And so we pull off the road and I get out the map and I'm still arguing. I'm not giving up easy. I said, look, this is the map. This is where we're at. And this is Franklin. And she said, you mean this Franklin on the other side of the Kentucky border? Because this is Franklin, Kentucky. We're trying to go to Franklin, Tennessee, which it looks to me like is down here at the bottom of the map, 20 minutes south of where we were. It's stressful when you're the one in control trying to go by a map. But those times where we've been able to use a guide, I think about, we took our family to Europe and we were in France and we hired a guide to take us out to the beaches of Normandy. And the guide shows up one morning at our uh, place we were staying, just knocks on the door, says, hop in this nice air-conditioned van. We hop in, the driver heads off. I don't know where he's going. I don't know the route he's taking. I don't know how long it's gonna take to get there. And I don't care. We just get to spend our time in, enjoying this guide, getting to know him, getting to hear his experiences as he lays out the maps in the van and starts explaining the story of what we're about to see because he's been there. He knows this area. He knows what to expect. We got to ask questions. We asked so many questions. My favorite question was one of us in the group asked, uh, who ended up winning this war? And he looked up and he said, you mean World War II? And I'm not gonna say who asked the question, but I will say that I think her dad would have been a lot more disappointed in that question than in my navigation skills. But he took it all in stride and he said, um, we, uh, the fact that I'm not speaking German probably ought to answer your question. But we just had so much fun. It was a ball. It was amazing. And I could just relax because I trusted him. I knew that he knew how to get us there, the roads to take and the roads to avoid. See, God wanted his people to learn that even though they were wandering in the middle of an unfamiliar desert, no idea what the day would bring, how long it would take or where they'd end up, that he was with them. 
He gave them the visual of the cloud and the fire just to remind them over and over of his presence. Just like he reminds us over and over in his word with, 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 with telling us, I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. One of his very names is Emmanuel, God with us. Look, if you feel lost, if you feel alone in these uncertain times like nobody sees, your God sees you. He loves you. He is with you. And it's only after we learn to let go and that he's with us through the journey that we can finally learn the third and most important lesson of all, I think, and it's this. We can learn to trust God for the journey. That he has a plan for this world and for our lives, and it's a good plan, and we, he, we can trust that he knows what he's doing. See, the interesting thing about a guide is you're not the one in control, but in the end, I would argue that the experience is so much richer and fuller and exciting, but you've got to be willing to put your trust in the one who's guiding God's ultimate goal with his children is that they would simply learn to trust him, to follow him, even when the route is unclear and difficult and doesn't seem to make sense. Notice when he guides them out of Egypt, he doesn't go the, uh, the, the expected direction. He instead goes the roundabout way, as the author calls it. Canaan would have just been an 11-day journey up the coastline. Very simple. But instead, God takes them sideways and south. And the journey ends up lasting 40 years. You talk about uncertainty. I mean, we complain about six months of this COVID craziness. Imagine 40 years of not knowing when the end is going to come and how it's going to come. And the writer here tells us the whole purpose of this journey was to prepare them for what was coming, for the battles that would lie ahead. Notice this interesting phrase used here. It says the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle because the truth was they were not ready for battle. And if they had taken the shortest route, they would have gone straight into Philistine territory. And the Philistines were fierce and they were relentless and they weren't ready for that. They would have retreated, surrendered and turned right back around. So God says, I'm gonna take you sideways so that you can learn to trust me, so that you will get to know me so that you will watch me as I part the Red Sea and learn that I'm the God of miracles. You'll watch as I drop manna out of the sky and you'll learn that I can provide for you even in the most difficult days. As the quail walk, walk the ground, you'll learn that I can sustain you. When your clothes don't wear out, you'll be amazed. And as I provide and take care of you in these difficult and uncertain circumstances, you're gonna learn to trust me, that I am the Lord your God and I can do anything and when you're finally ready one day to move into the promised land and you have to go through those difficult battles, the Philistines or whatever battle it is you're facing today, you will have learned that with me, we can do this together, that nothing is impossible with our God. And so today, today we're gonna go sideways. And maybe in these times of uncertainty where it may feel like your life is going sideways, we ought to be thinking about and even asking, God, are you preparing me for something bigger, something more challenging, something better that may be coming in my future? Are you positioning me now for an opportunity that may be coming months or years down, down the line? One of my bucket list ambitions is to go on what's called a repositioning cruise. And I know I'm one of the only people on the planet who still wants to step foot on a cruise ship right now, but I am. Um, but the reason that's so appealing to me is because, first of all, cruises are appealing. I mean, you got a, a buffet, unending buffet that's just steps away from your hotel room. So what's not great about that? And you're floating around on a beautiful you know, body of water. But for a repositioning cruise, it means the cruise line is repositioning their cruise about twice a year they do this, where they take it from one area of the world to another area of the world to get that ship ready for a different itinerary. And the other thing that appeals to me about it is it's usually a little cheaper because it's a two-week cruise. It goes across the Atlantic. There's not really many stops along the way, which is my favorite thing about just sitting on a ship and seeing nothing but water. And uh, it's a little more dangerous. The water's a little more unpredictable. And uh, it just there's something about it that a lot of people don't want to do it. And so it ends up costing a little less. And so it's exactly up my alley. But from the ship line's perspective... They're just thinking, we got to get our ship ready for its new adventure. We got to position it so it's ready for its new itinerary. And I think God often puts us in periods of uncertainty and uncharted waters because he is repositioning us. He is preparing us for a whole new adventure that we can't even begin to anticipate or imagine. You think about young Joseph, 13 years he was on a repositioning cruise. 
He was sold by his brothers, betrayed by Potiphar's wife, ends up in a dungeon, and finally God has him positioned right where he needs him, second in command in Egypt. And I'm sure at the time it didn't make any sense to him, but looking back on it, he got it. It's when he says those famous words to his brothers. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people because our God, he's in the life-saving business. Or Paul, who ends up writing most of our New Testament, finds himself in a jail cell with Silas. You talk about a sideways journey. He's supposed to be preaching the gospel, bringing people to Christ, and he's in chains in a dungeon. And he and Silas are singing and praying in the dark and there's this earthquake and their chains break and you think, oh great, this is their great escape moment. But the jailer himself is about to fall on his own sword because he's so scared of what's gonna happen when all the prisoners escape. And out of the darkness, Paul and Silas speak and they say, don't worry, we're still here. And scripture says the jailer fell at, the, at his feet and said, sir, what must I do to be saved? And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. His whole family came to know Jesus, came to know God. And I can tell you, they weren't the only ones rejoicing. There was a party going on in heaven that day because that's the kind of God that we serve. A God who would take the great apostle Paul on a sideways, roundabout, unexpected, this makes no sense type of journey simply for the sake of an unnamed Roman guard, a nobody who needed to hear that there is a God in heaven who sees him and who loves him and who has a great plan for his life. Our God loves people and he will do whatever it takes to rescue them from the clutches of sin and destruction. And that may mean you and I have to take a detour, go a roundabout way, be repositioned so that when the time is right, we are ready, we are in place. What if we approach these times of uncertainty, not grumbling and complaining, not raising our fist in defiance or anger towards God, but instead with anticipation, God, is this my opportunity? Are you repositioning me now? God, will you help me to have your eyes to see what you're up to around me during these days? Because I can assure you, God is at work in the hearts and lives of the people that you come in contact with every day. What if we woke up every day with the words of the prophet Isaiah on our lips? Here I am, Lord, send me. Will you use me today to build your kingdom? See, I think I finally figured out the main difference between the heroes of our faith and me boils down to their level of trust. Because I look at the great men and women that we read about in scripture and I realize they're flawed just like me. They mess up, they are scared, they're often prone to wonder just like me. But the difference between them and me is that they've learned to really trust their God, our God, in spite of their fear and confusion and the uncertainty that life brings. Years ago, a man named John Cavanaugh went to work in Calcutta alongside Mother Teresa because he wanted to get some clarity for his life. And on the first morning, he meets her and she says, what can I do for you? Can you imagine having that invitation from Mother Teresa? And he said, would you pray for me? Would you pray that I would have clarity in my life? And she firmly looked back at him and she said, no, I won't pray that. Now that's not the answer you would expect, is it, from Mother Teresa? And so he asked why. And she said, because clarity, I think, is the last thing that you're clinging to and you have to let go of. And then she laughed and she said, I've never had clarity. What I've always had is trust. So I'm gonna pray that you learn to trust God. Look, our God is writing a much bigger story than just my story. And if I'm gonna be included in his next chapter of written about the heroes of our faith, I've gotta to learn to let go. I've gotta realize that he's with me along the journey and then I've gotta trust him enough to follow him wherever he leads, even in those uncertain in-between places where it feels like I'm going a roundabout way, knowing that he has a purpose and a plan and maybe, just maybe, He's positioning me so that I'm in the right place at the right time to help him lead someone who's lost and that he loves back to himself. And so God, may the prayer of our hearts just be this. Will you send us? Will you use us? May we be people who are good to go.